Department 2 of Sparrow County will be the fiscal agent uh, for processing payroll, including city, state, federal, tax deductions, and other associated deductions. The county will also administer the health insurance benefits of employees. In layman's terms, we said all along, SCOG would be the uh, overseers of the project, but the administration and the administration side, where the county would be the fiscal side. Uh, they do this in a couple other areas. I think Jobs and Family Services has their own boards or run independently, and yet they are paid for as county employees, and their insurance and everything goes through the counties. I don't know if Mike could probably explain that better than I do, but it's not, again, not reinventing the wheel. I think there's agencies out there that would operate close to this one. I might add to that that uh, this is no different than presently how we do crime lab, only the crime lab is the city employees, and in this case it would be county employees. Uh, so SCOG has some precedence with doing it in this fashion. It's just a matter of uh, uh, whose actual payroll they would be on and who SCOG would reimburse for those employee expenses. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Any questions on that? Just, and again, Karen, just to correct the record, Jobs and Family Services isn't a good example because that's actually the Department of County Government. But the county does serve as fiscal agent for many other non-departmental entities. Yeah, it's and it's very, very, again, comparable to our analogous situation with the crime lab and the city can't do this. Okay. Now, I guess my only question that comes along that line is obviously Senate Bill Number 5 creates a hurdle, I think, for some entities that have present employees that would roll into this or have to become members of this because Senate Bill 5 has an issue uh, attached to it that a council of governments cannot have unionized employee. And I guess my question, and maybe it's a legal one for uh, uh, John and Joe here, is if these employees become actual County employees, would they be able to unionize since they're not actually SCOG employees? Yes, sir. Excuse me. Can anybody bring any legal action against this SCOG for keep continuing running this without it actually against the law? Good area, Paul. I'm sorry. Can, can any? Body legally sue us for bring legal action against God for operating something that we can't legally do. Well, I think that's what, and Randy, I'm not trying to jump no, here. I think ahead. that's why he's trying to make a contingent right. on that because right now we're not operating. Scog is not operating this center. This center has not been built to be turned over to Scog. Okay, so we're not operating it at this point in violation of any state law. Uh, however, we would not be able to begin that operation until the law was changed. That's why we're going to go through these four, Paul, so that you know, if these don't happen, there's not going to be a sign. Any other question on the PSAP? That being understood, uh, point number two. Uh, Point number two is Star County will be the fiscal agent uh, for processing payroll, including city, state, federal tax deductions and other associated deductions. The county will also administer the health insurance benefits of employees. In layman's terms, we said all along, SCOG would be the uh, overseers of the project, but the administration and the administration side, where the county would be the fiscal side. Uh, they do this in a couple other areas. I think Jobs and Family Services has their own boards or run independently, and yet they are paid for as county employees, and their insurance and everything goes through the counties. I don't know if Mike could probably explain that better than I do, but it's not, again, not reinventing the wheel. I think there's agencies out there that would operate close to this one. I might add to that that uh, this is no different than presently how we do crime lab, only the crime lab is the city employees, and in this case it would be county employees, uh, so SCOG has some precedence with
with doing it in this fashion. It's just a matter of uh, uh, whose actual payroll they would be on and whose God would reimburse for those employee expenses. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Any questions on that? Just, and again, Mr. Chairman, just to correct the record, uh, Jobs and Family Services isn't a good example because that's actually the Department of County Government. But the county does serve as fiscal agent for many other non departmental entities. And it's a And it's very, very, again, comparable. Everybody understand that? Now, I guess my only question that comes along that line is obviously, Senate Bill number five creates a hurdle, I think, for some entities that have present employees that would roll into this or have to become members of this because Senate Bill five has an issue attached to it that a council of governments cannot have unionized. And I guess my question, and maybe it's a legal one for uh, uh, John and Joe here, is if these employees become actual county employees, would they be able to unionize since they're not actually SCOG employees? Because I know that's going to be a hurdle in some cases, in some uh, jurisdictions. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to say that I'm up here uh, wanting to misinterpret, but if they're actual county employees rather than SCOG employees, does that get us around the hurdle of Senate Bill 5 if Senate Bill 5 holds true uh, that a unionized employee cannot work for SCOG? or a council of governments. Uh, do we need further research on that? Do you have an opinion to offer, Joe? The entry paragraph, uh, the, for, the foreword, in the motion is that SCOG will be the organization that will administer and perform all responsibilities. So even though number two says that the county will be the fiscal agent for processing and, and other functions, I read this to be that SCOG would be the employing entity Way it reads. Is that how you intend it, Randy? No, I would think the fiscal agents would be the What they did here, the employee. I think the county. And the county's doing their payroll. I don't know. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I think probably just think that this is a pretty, pretty narrow issue, and I don't know whether this uh, prevents us from moving on on the general concept that, that he had before us. But uh, I would agree with Mr. Martinez, who I think that. Probably, and again, this is probably most akin to the situation that we would have, for example, with the Star County uh, Board of Developmental Disabilities. Star County government is the fiscal agent for them, but the mental health recovery services, and mental health recovery services, and other boards of that nature. Star being independent, they are actually, the employers are those independent boards. They are not county employees, although the county is a fiscal agent. So again, I don't know that they become county employees by virtue of the county. I, I'm not answering that in black and white, but I think it's an issue that it probably leans in that direction, but it's probably something that needs a little bit you know, further to look at by uh, the legal process. Uh, uh, one of the issues was the, the well being and future uh, for our employees that are involved in this, our dispatch center people. And Senate Bill 5 puts another twist in from what we initially told those and that is that uh, your, uh, your retirement was first and foremost a concern of ours and that you don't lose time on your retirement and that we would not be opposed to uh, unionizing once you got in your new positions. And now Senate Bill 5 then creates a situation where they can't unionize. And we've, we've had these discussions with our union officials now that game has changed a little bit. Is it a game breaker? I don't think anything is a game breaker, but it certainly presents a challenge that we didn't have before, and there will be issues and discussions, and whether you want to call <coughs> negotiations or decisions made, 
uh, reference those issues because there, there are employees that uh, uh, well-being and, and job security that is at stake. And uh, I simply point that out, bring that up, because I think there's other jurisdictions, being the Red Center where the employees are unionized. I don't know if there's been any discussion with them. Uh, reference uh, if this would roll into Scott or not. Uh, but I would think for a lot of these other agencies, there would be similar uh, concerns, uh, and it's just going to create something that we're going to have to uh, have dialogue, uh, have open discussions, and come to resolutions. Uh, right now, I can't tell you what that resolution is for the city of Kent because we haven't had any new discussion with our employees. And, for lack of a better term, the jury's still out, so to speak, on Senate Bill 5. But and will be till at least November. Part of this process, we have looked at this union issues from day one. And there's many, I should say many, all the dispatch agencies just about have different unions. There's like three or four of them, different ones out there. We personally contacted most of those union reps, and they pretty much told us just stay out of it. What will happen is as this center gets built, they're going to, the employees will decide if they can, the Senate Bill 5, which union they want. You know, it could be ASME, it could be FOP. All the unions are pretty much saying as, as the elected officials stay out and let the employees choose if they want to be unionized and which union they would pick. So we have kept up on that. And then lastly, I, just because Tom Burnaby's sitting next to me and he always calls me the eternal optimist. I believe Senate Bill 5, if you look at every 